Well, welcome back to the channel, everybody. It looks like today's episode is all about fork seals. So why don't you sit back, grab yourself something cold to drink, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. I think I need to order some parts. See you in a minute. <laughs> Oh, what a mess there's oil everywhere this whole stanchion tube I think has leaked most of its oil out through the top cap I'm gonna get this off the floor Holy man oh man I'll be honest with you I kind of noticed that the fork seals were leaking on my last trip out with Carl when I went out into the parking lot on the second day I could see a little bit of oil weeping from the top of the fork stanchions coming out from the fork protectors themselves. The DR650 uses a traditional damper rod fork in it with a conventional stanchion tube that fits down near the axle. It's not an inverted fork like a lot of modern bikes. Which means that when the fork seals start to leak, you're going to see a small amount of oil seeping down the stanchion tubes and because we were off-road, a lot of dirt and material had stuck to the fork itself. You can see that here. This dirt and debris, if left unchecked, will further erode your fork seals and potentially damage the chrome on the sliders themselves. So it's a process or it's a repair that you kind of want to get fixed as soon as you notice it. I get a lot of questions about the suspension on my DR650, specifically whether or not I've upgraded it in any way. The answer is no, I haven't. I've owned the bike for a year, and the only thing that I can tell is the rear spring looks like it's been changed on the shock. It looks like it has a bit of a heavier spring than stock, probably because the previous owner took the bike out to Alaska a couple times and probably had quite a bit of weight on the back. So that makes a lot of sense that they would have upgraded that spring. In terms of the front fork, it's difficult to really tell without opening the fork up if there's been any kind of change to the fork internals. Today we're going to do two things. One is I'm going to address the fact that my fork seals are leaking. So we're going to change those fork seals out. I'll show you how to do that freshen it up with some clean oil and then put it back together. That'll get the bike back out onto the road and I can enjoy the rest of my riding season. But the second thing is really about investigating what's inside the fork. I want to take a look at the spring and try to determine if it's a stock spring or maybe it's been upgraded. Maybe there's a progressive spring in there or even a heavier straight rate spring to sort of counteract the weight of the fuel tank and my belly. I also want to take a look at the, if there's any kind of damping technology over and above that damping rod that comes standard with the front fork. Now this could be things like emulators or cogent discs. It could be a bunch of different things. I have a suspicion that the fork is bone stock inside, but the only way to really tell is to get it apart and up on the bench. So why don't we get started? Because this bike's been out riding in the dirt and it's got a lot of debris kind of glued to the stanchion tubes, the first thing I need to do is give it a really good bath and get all of that contamination off of the bike. It's really important when you get inside of systems, whether it's the engine, the carburetor, or in this case, the fork tubes, that you get as much contamination off of these forks before you ever open them up. The last thing you want is that 
sort of dirt and gravel and grit getting down into the fork itself after you open it up and potentially damaging either the chrome on the sliders or the bushings that sit down inside or maybe even the new seals that you're going to put on the bike. So take your time, wash the bike really well and even after we get the forks off we're going to continue to clean it with de degreasers and different kinds of things to make sure it's nice and clean before we get into the bike or into the fork. So let me get this thing outside. I know I've covered this before, but I do think it's worth re-mentioning that when you're washing your bike with a pressure washer, try to use lower pressure power washers. Mine's only 1300 PSI, and often I'll only use the 40 degree nozzle on the bike. Try to avoid things like seals or your air box or electrical components so you don't force water into areas that it's not meant to be. A good brush will just loosen up all that material and before you know it, things are nice and clean again. Okay, I'm gonna let this sit and dry. It's probably gonna be a few hours before it's completely dry. I might blow it off a little bit with, uh, with my leaf blower just to speed it up. But I wanna get all that water dried up before I start taking the forks out. I'm gonna go get something to eat. Okay, my belly's full and I'm done chitter chattering about how to wash your motorcycle. It's time to actually get in and get this project done. One thing I'm gonna say is if you've never worked on your DR650's front end, a service manual is always a good thing to have. And you've heard me say this before. It gives you a lot of confidence. You can take a look through there. It'll give you all the blow-ups of how the fork actually goes together. And if you need that information, you forget maybe how it came apart, this will tell you everything you need to know, torque specs, fluid types, and everything like that. And you may notice I've got my dashboard off of my bike today. Now that's really just for you, so I can get better camera angles. You don't have to take your fairing off or your headlight bucket like I did. But for me, it just makes it a little easier to navigate around the bike. The first thing you will need to do though is take off your front wheel. Now if you've never done this before, again it's in your service manual. I'll walk you through it now just in case you've never done it before. Now the front wheel is really held in place with a axle that's clamped down with a tie strap so it can't turn when it's tightened up. The first thing we're going to do though is take out the speedometer drive cable. Now the speedometer drive cable fits into this thing, which is your speedometer drive, and it sits down on the right-hand side of your front wheel. In order to get this out, the cable is held in place with a small machine screw. The fastener that you, that you need to take that out, or the screwdriver that you need to take that fastener out, is a Japanese industrial standard, or JIS screwdriver. Now this screwdriver looks very, very much like a Phillips, and in a pinch, a good quality Phillips screwdriver will do the job. The JIS screwdrivers are built a little differently, the profile's a little different, and they're less likely to cam out when you put a lot of force on them when you use them on Japanese fasteners, which most motorcycles have, at least if they came from Japan. So we're gonna take that threaded screw out, and then we're just gonna pull the cable straight back. Now it sometimes feels like it's stuck in there, but just give it a good wiggle and it'll pull out. The next thing we're gonna do is pull it back through the retaining loom that's attached to the fork. Now take note of how this passes through the loom. You wanna make sure when you put it back together you get it the same way. And then I'm gonna put it into a Ziploc bag to protect the cable from getting any dirt or debris on it. And I'll just zip that up and I'll tuck it back against the frame out of the way while we do our project. Next, I'm gonna take a 10 millimeter wrench or socket and loosen the four nuts that hold down the tie strap. Now again, this tie strap basically pinches the axle when it's tight so that the axle can never back out. And it's a really easy system to understand and it's easy to take apart. Now you don't have to take these nuts right off. You can just loosen them up. Um, but if you do happen to take them off, maybe you wanna clean the threads up and put some anti-seize on them make sure that you take note of the tie strap itself. It's actually indexed 
to go a certain way and there's a little arrow that tells you which which direction that cap goes back on now once you've loosened it off take your 19 millimeter wrench or socket and unthread the axle from the right hand tube you'll see on the left hand side there's a socket just turn it and turn it turn it eventually the axle will come out now support the wheel before you actually take the axle fully out but when you do remove it two things are likely to happen one is the bushing that sits on the right hand fork tube is going to fall out so be ready for that and keep an eye on where it goes and secondly this drive mechanism is probably going to fall out as well now the manual does tell you how this goes back together and I'll show you here but what I do is I take the axle tube and I'll push it through the the drive mechanism put the bushing back on the axle the right way and that way it keeps it all organized and keeps it in one place so when it comes to reassembly you know exactly where it is now this is also a good time to inspect your dust seals and your bearings on your front wheel so take a look make sure there's no grit or water inside there stick your finger in the bearing and turn it and make sure it rotates smoothly and that there's no noise or play in the bearings if there is you may have to change those out but that'll be for another video okay we got front wheel off we set it aside I guess it's time to start taking apart the fork tubes now remember I've got my fairing off you don't need to do that but uh, anyway let's get going on that now because we're going to be removing both the front wheel and the forks you can see the bike becomes a little bit unstable on the jack to solve this I'm going to do two things one is I'm going to use some scrap plywood and some solid pine here to support most of the weight of the bike Next, I'm going to use this interesting thing called a flip clip that I got for Christmas about 10 years ago. I don't even know if you can still buy these things, but basically it's a small clamp that goes around one of your floor joists. And then this small light duty clamp fits inside. Now this is not meant for any kind of load carrying, but I put a small ratchet strap on here to sort of stabilize the bike. Again, this isn't going to hold any weight up. It's just there to keep the bike stable. The fork tubes are held in place with your triple trees and the top triple tree clamp has a small 14 millimeter headed bolt that grips the top of the tube. I want to loosen this now and this allows me to actually break free the 22 millimeter nut that sits on the top of the fork tubes. You need to do this now before you loosen off the lower triple tree clamps. I'll put the socket on and I'll just break it free enough so that I can loosen it off later when the tube's out of the bike. Here's something that I noticed that I didn't see before. Notice how when I put this socket on this side, I can get it right on, no problem. There's room for both the socket and the extension. When I come over to this side, well, I can't do it. You want to know the reason? The handlebars are actually bent. Not a lot, but now that I'm looking at it really closely, I can see that the throttle side's bent. This means at some point in the future, I'm going to have to put a set of handlebars on here. So leave a comment below and let me know what you think I should put on here for handlebars when I finally get around to it. The brake caliper has to come off of the fork tube in order to get the fork tube out of the bike, but I do want you to take note of the way in which the brake hose routes in behind the stanchion tube and then clamps at the top of the lower tube. You have to remove this from the clamp, and it's just a small machine bolt that you undo and then the hose comes off. I like to put the fasteners back in the hole when I can like this. It keeps everything organized and it's good practice. And then using a six-sided socket so we don't strip these off, I'm going to undo these and then I'll do the same thing. I'll put the bolts into the caliper and I'll hang this with a little bit of machinist wire off of the frame just so the hose doesn't have a lot of stress on it. Once this is done, I'm going to come up with an Allen key and I'm going to break free these cap head bolts which are way, way too tight. Someone just reefed on these things, but once you get these loose, the tube just slides straight out the bottom of the bike and you can put it up on the bench. Now with the fork up on the bench, 
the next thing that I want to do is take off the uh, protective boot here. And this again is held in place just with two clamps. And I'm going to use this GIS screwdriver. A good sharp Phillips will work. I'll loosen these two clamps off here. There we go. So you can kind of see it's still pretty clean up in here. But I'll get the boot off and I'll set that aside. The next step, and you can see how much oil's kind of coming up around this. The next step is to clean everything really, really well. So I'm going to start down here where it's really dirty, I clean all that off, and I work my way up. I'm going to do that with my favorite product, Brake Clean, <laughs> just because I like Brake Clean. But you can see it will clean all the stuff off here. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this, and then we'll come back. All right, I've got all of the gunge off of this fork, and now I just want to run my fingers along all of the chrome and feel for any kind of pitting. This one actually has some marks here from the lower triple clamp, but I can't feel any roughness. I can't get my nail on them or anything, so I think they're, they're okay. If you do find some nicks in here, what'll happen is the chrome will actually yeah it'll it'll pit through the chrome and it'll actually rust you'll get rough spots and that's a lot of the times what can damage your fork seals dirt penetration is really the number one thing it gets in underneath the protective boot and sort of works its way underneath your seal and scratches the seal up to the point that it fails or it could just be time i mean this is a 2009 i'm pretty confident someone's been into this already at least once and the reason for that is the 22 millimeter bolt that holds the spring in had some wear on it so I know someone's been into these forks at some point or another whether it was to modify them or just put new fork seals in so I think we're okay if you do find that there's some light pitting you can use some very very fine sandpaper to try and smooth that out like 1500 that kind of thing and sort of wet sand it to try and smooth some of those pits out. I, some people I've heard recommend using a file. I think that's a little too aggressive. But you can polish this a little bit and get this uh, finish as smooth as possible. And, that, and that's prevention for the future so you don't damage those new seals that we're about to put in. The next step to disassembly is to actually remove that top cap that we loosened earlier while it was in the bike. So I'm going to do that right now. What you need to realize is that top cap is somewhat spring-loaded because the, it's applying a little bit of preload to the spring inside of the fork. So as we get close to the top of the threads, we're going to want to make sure we hold that nut in place. And here's how we do it. I'm going to take it and I'm going to set it down onto the ground like this. Next, using my 22 millimeter wrench, I'm going to continue to unthread this. Now remember, we loosened this while it was in the bike. Basically, the cap on these things is a big threaded bolt, or a nut actually. No, I guess it would be a bolt. So I'm, I'm using my thumb here to hold the spring pressure down as I turn the stanchion tubes. And as you get closer, it gets easier. And I'm just waiting for that thing to pop. It's getting close, I can feel it. There it goes. And here is our retaining nut. Now that the nut is out, we can start to see what's inside. Now, interestingly, I see here, this is not the factory spacer. This is actually a two and three quarter inch looks like a piece of ABS, one inch ABS or something like that, that they made their own spacers out of. That's interesting. You should have um, a standard steel spacer in yours. Now I'm going to just collapse this a little more and on top of the spring pack is a washer. You can see that there. I'm going to set that aside 
and then out comes the spring itself and it just pulls straight up and I'm just pulling it out slow here so I don't get oil all over the place and this looks like a straight rate spring there we go keep coming there we go and there's our spring right there I'm gonna set this up on the bench now I'm gonna dump out whatever oils in this tube here into my drain pan and it looks pretty gross it looks to me like there's a little bit of water in it too because it's a little bit milky I'm just gonna give it a couple pumps here and you'll see you'll get a little bit more out of it I can feel there's still fluid up up in this end you can actually hear it running through the damper rods on top of your standard hand tools I ordered three specific tools for for the DR assembly here and I ordered them from Rocky Mountain and they weren't that expensive I think the whole kit came to around ninety dollars now what I got was a fork seal driver and this is a 43 millimeter fork seal driver and it's made by Tusk and you can see it kind of splits goes around your fork and allows you to drive your seals in squarely and it's a really well made tool I think this was around forty dollars I also got Motion Pro's fork seal bullet for 43 millimeter forks this is designed to protect your fork seals as they're being slid onto the stanchion tubes this isn't necessary but it for five dollars I think it was it's a great way to make sure your seals aren't damaged during installation there are some videos out there that actually use old milk bottles the plastic milk bottles and make a device very similar to this and, and certainly you can do that my thinking is fork seal replacement is a bit of a maintenance item that you know if you ride your bike at all uh, aggressively you're going to be doing this occasionally and what's interesting is the number of motorcycles from different manufacturers that use the exact same seal technology as the DR650 so these can be used on a multitude of bikes the last tool is this tusk tool that's designed to hold the damping rod and allow you to unscrew the one bolt on the bottom which I'll show you now there's all kinds of different hacks out there um, and I'm not talking about people but different different life hacks to get around this tool whether it's um, some square steel tubing or some wood that you jam down in there or just using an impact gun to loosen the, the bolt on the bottom of the fork this tool was like $19 I think if you wanted to make one it's an inch and an eighth nut on the end that's welded to a piece of pipe and made into a T like this so you could easily make one of these if you can find an inch and an eighth nut a little bit of threaded rod and you could hold it with a pair of vice grips for all that matters you just put a little tack on there to hold the nut from spinning and you could make this tool but for $20 and the price of steel today this was a pretty good product for me my philosophy on tools is you buy the tool instead of having someone fix your bike so it pays for itself and then you always have the tool they never go bad and you never know when you're gonna need them that's my philosophy the next thing we're gonna do is we are gonna pull out that retaining spring and I'm gonna use a pick here and this might not look the the smoothest just because I'm doing it upside down look and there it is okay but basically you don't want to scratch your your stanchion tube but you do want to get this thing out of there so you're gonna pry it and and basically walk it around I think it'd be the smoothest thing here I'll tell you oop a second here we go I got a hold of it and I'm gonna bring it up so think of this is sort of like um, changing a flat on your bicycle tire right kind of walk around and eventually that retaining spring will come out you can kind of see it there I'm just gonna walk it all the way around if I can and turn it here so you can see a little better 
get this side out. There we go. And we're almost there. Just take your time. Don't scratch the tubes. That's the big thing. There. And we'll just slide it gently up and off. And I'll set that aside. If you look down inside the tube now, what you're going to see is this 12-pointed recess inside the fork tube. That's the top of your damping rod. So I am going to put the fork into the vise here with some soft jaws just to hold the bottom of the tube. And on the other end, I'm going to support it with a small piece of plywood that I basically put into a hand screw to make an easy, quick base. Once this is done, I'm gently going to slide that tool down, making sure not to damage the threads, and then lock it into that star-shaped recess on the top of the damper tube. I'm going to hold this with my left hand, and then on the other end, I'm going to insert an 8mm Allen key into this cap head screw. Now, you don't use a ball head here. Use a straight Allen key so you don't damage the cap head screw. And then gently apply pressure until you break the uh, Loctite that's holding that bolt in place. Now, once I got to a certain point, I decided I'd just put my electric ratchet on and back the bolt out the rest of the way. As it is kind of a longer bolt, just be aware that when that bolt comes out, there's going to be a little bit of oil that drains out that hole. So have a rag or something underneath it. Here you can see that cap head screw. And it has a copper sealing washer on the bottom of it. You don't want to lose that washer. Otherwise your fork's going to leak. I'm going to clean all this up though so that the actual bolt's in better shape. I'm going to set it aside for now though. Now that we have the bolt out, we need to get the seals out. So inside the stanchion tube is a pair of uh, Teflon coated guides that sort of float in there. We're going to use those almost like a slide hammer to pull these seals out from up top here. One of the tricks that I kind of like is to use a little bit of a heat gun. And, and um, I learned this from Rocky Mountain Off-Road to heat this to sort of loosen the stiction between the seals. So I'm going to do that. I'll just turn it on low, take some time, and heat the seals up. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a hold of the lower stanchion and the upper stanchion and knock the seals out like this. You can see that how they're kind of moving out. There we go. And now I can just drain any remaining oil out of this. Here is your dust and your oil seal. And I can actually feel grit right there. It's, look, you can almost see it. I don't know if you can see that or not. There's definitely some grit right there, which probably means some of it's made its way inside. Here you can see the placement of the dust seal, the oil seal, this washer, and then your two glides here that go up and down now overall these look okay this lower one i think has a fair bit of wear on it but i think it'll be okay i probably should change these but i'm not gonna because <laughs> i think i'm gonna upgrade the fork anyway there's obviously nothing other than damping rod technology going on here okay i am going to slide off both the dust seal and the oil seal here and there was a great trick I can't remember what website it was but when they take the old seal out they cut a little notch in the top of it like this so a you know this is the old seal and B you know that that faces up so you can actually compare the old seals to the new one to make sure that they go on right so I'm gonna slide off the oil seal and I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to put a little notch in it. And that way I know which way it goes. Like that. And you can kind of see there's a steel spring that sits inside of that. That fits down facing the oil. That's an easy way to know as well. So anyway, those two I'll put together here. Just so I know where they are. Then, off comes your uh, 
washer here. So I'm just going to put everything, I'm going to stack it all so that it's all in one order. And finally, off comes the bushing. So the damper rod comes out like this, and you'll see that there is a spring on the bottom of the damper rod. And then on the end here, there's another bushing. And I'm going to get that bushing out. It seems to be wedged in there. But that bushing fits down on the end of the damper rod when you put the fork together. Now, it only fits on one way. It can't go on this way. It only fits on the one way. And look at how bad the oil was in there. It's just terrible. So all of this will all have to be cleaned up. And that is how it works. One thing I really find interesting about the DR650 is the fact that right from the factory, they've given you the option to lower the seat height by two full inches if you're a shorter rider or you just don't like the height of the bike. Everything you need is right there on the motorcycle. You can lower the rear suspension by simply moving the pivot bolt on the linkage on the bottom of the bike. Now for the fork, many people think all you have to do is undo the triple clamps and slide your forks up through the triple trees until they're sticking up a couple inches. And you see this quite a bit. Now, this is absolutely not necessary with the DR650 and, and really any bike that you do this to, you're really changing the geometry of the front head tube and in turn making the bike handle differently than it was supposed to from the factory. If you read the manual, it's going to tell you that you can simply lower the front height of the DR650 by changing around a couple of the internals inside the fork. And here's how you do it. When you have the damper rod out like this, you'll see that there's this bottom out spring here, or whatever this is, and then you've got this little cup. Well, the factory uh, ride height of the bike, this is how this would look. The spring would go on top and then the spacer fits way up here at the top on the, on the top of the springs. If you want to lower the motorcycle, all you have to do is while you have the bike uh, or the forks apart is take the cap off, take the spring off and take that spacer and slide it here and then put the rebound spring back in. Now you assemble the fork exactly the same way other than the fact the spacer is now below this spring. Believe it or not, when you put the fork back together, it's going to sit two inches lower than it did originally from the factory. It also calls for, I think, a little less oil. I'll, I'll put the, the fluid amount here. When you do reassemble the fork, it's kind of weird, but I think it takes a little less fork oil as well. But then you install the fork at the normal height in the triple tree and the bike is lowered two inches on the front end. Anyway, it's just a neat little thing that the DR650 has. Some people don't know, but now you do. To reassemble the fork, we're going to need some fork oil. And I'm going to use Motul's fork oil here, and I'm going to use their 10 weight medium fork oil. You're going to need a little over a liter almost 1100 or 1200 milliliters so you need two of these which is unfortunate it would have been nice if it was about 400 milliliters however you need two this was about twenty dollars a liter here for this fork oil there is a lot of discussion on different forums about the weight of oil the thicker the oil the more damping you're going to get out of the fork. It's going to take more to compress it and it's going to rebound slower. Unfortunately for the DR650, that's the only tuning for damping that you can have. The thicker the oil, the harder it is for it to pass through these damping holes that are drilled in the bottom of the damping rod. I'm going to go just with 10 weight because that is what the factory manual calls for. And again, I don't ride really aggressively, so I don't want to have a slower fork than I need. So I'm just going to put the 10 weight oil in. And again, when I upgrade the fork, I may change this depending on what I do internally. So I'm going to put a little bit of this in a little bowl. 
and use it as a little bit of an assembly lube as I put the fork back together just with a paintbrush. I'll paint this onto the different components and then we're going to put, I think it's, uh, I'll have to look it up, but I think it's a 565 milliliters of oil per tube, I think. I'll look that up if I'm not right on that. Okay, let me get this decanted out and we'll start reassembly. For reassembly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by putting our bushing back on gently. And then I'm going to use that fork oil like an assembly lube. I'm going to paint the top of the damper rod where that piston ring is just to make sure it slides in nice and smooth. I'll paint the spring and you know what? I'm even going to paint that small plastic cap on the end even though I'm going to take it off before I insert the rod into the fork. Okay, we're going to take the damper rod and we're going to install that into the upper fork tube until it slides out the bottom. Be careful when you're installing it. You don't want to damage this um, piston ring up at the top here. So be careful as you go across the threads in the top of the tube. I'm just going to support it with my hand. Now this will go all the way in like this. And then as it gets in, I'm going to sort of lay it a little flat so it doesn't come crashing down and stick my finger in the end to catch the damping rods, kind of like this. And then I'm going to guide it out gently out the bottom of the fork tube like that. Next, I'm going to lubricate both of these bushings at the bottom here with a little bit of fork oil. This will just make them slide in there well, and it won't hurt a thing. Okay, I am now going to slide the upper into the lower part of the fork tube. Before I do that, I'm going to take our little bushing here and I'm going to slide it onto the end. And again, it only goes on one way. It needs to bottom out right at this shoulder here, just like that. Now we can insert it into the lower fork tube. Now gently, I'm gonna pick up the fork tube and I'm gonna slide it down into the lower half. Now remember, there's no seals or anything on this. We wanna make sure we don't scratch anything, so we're gonna be gentle. I'm just gonna pick it up and gently slide it in until it bottoms out in the bottom, like so. There we go. What we do next is we take our Allen key that we, or our Allen bolt that we took out originally, and you're supposed to replace that copper washer, but <laughs> I'm not gonna. And it calls for a medium strength thread locker, which I have some, so that's blue. Let's see here. I'll put just a dab of blue thread locker on this. And then I'm just gonna thread it into the bottom of the damper rod the way we did before. And I can feel it catching in there already, I think. Let's see. Nope. I might need to push it down with that damper rod tool. So I'll put the tool back in the end, gently, not scratching any of the threads, until I feel it lock into the damper tube. And I think that's it. And now I should be able to tighten that nut up at the end. Let's have a look here. Here we go. I think I got it now. There, now it's going in. What I'll do next is I'm going to clamp it into the vise and I'll torque this down to the torque spec. Now we're going to actually install the washer that goes down next. So this goes down in and sits on top of that one bushing. Next is time to put the seals in. The seal kit that I chose was from All Balls Racing and it's kit number 56-136. Now, if you remember when I was talking about the seal driver, how many other bikes actually use this particular seal and this size fork, look at the amount of different bikes that are on here. There's KDX 200s, DR 800s, IT 200s, uh, Super Tenere's. There's a bunch of different bikes that still use this style of fork. So 
the purchasing of all those tools can possibly be used on other bikes in the future. Now, All Balls Racing, I've had very good luck with their products over the years. And I can't see any reason why these seals would be any less. Go fast sticker. You can see they're nicely packaged. There's two in each package, both the dust seals over here and the oil seals as well. So these should work really well in the bike. Now it's time to put those seals in place. And this is where I'm gonna use one of the tools that I bought, and that is this fork bullet. Again, this is designed to help the seal slide over the square edges on the top of the fork tube. And it just slides on like that. Next, I'm going to take a look at the old seals. And remember, I put that notch in the end of it, which allows me to compare it to the placement of the new seal. And here I can see it goes in like this. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a little bit of grease and I'm going to grease the inside of the actual seal. Now the oil seal goes on first and I'm going to slide that down from the top over the fork bullet. There we go. And it slides on easily. And I'm just going to push that down all the way and seat it in there. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take our seal driver and notice how it comes apart like this. We're going to place it gently around the actual tube and then we're just going to gently tap the seal down. And it goes all the way in and you'll feel the, the, the sound and the feel of it changes when it bottoms out. There it goes. Did you hear the change in the sound? Here we go. You don't want to beat this thing to death. And then gently bring it up and separate it. We're going to do the same thing now with the dust seal. So I'm just going to put a little bit of grease on there. Not a lot. And again, over the fourth bullet and down onto the top of the tube. We'll take our seal driver again, gently placing it around so we don't scratch anything. And then we're going to tap that one in as well. And that one went in really easy. Lastly, we're going to take our clip and we're going to reinsert it into the top grooves to lock the seals in place. So I'm going to drop it down and then walk that in. And a good trick that I learned, I think from Rocky Mountain where I bought this stuff, is to take the seal driver and then gently tap that retaining ring so it squares it up and it expands into the groove. And you, my friend, have changed your fork seals. All that's left now is to reassemble it and fill it with some fork oil. So why don't we do that? I don't own an actual graduated cylinder, but I do have a measuring cup that measures in 50 milliliter increments. So what I'll do is I'll measure out 550 milliliters in this one, and then I have a small measuring cup that measures, believe it or not, in 15 milliliter increments. So I'll just add that to the main cup and then pour it into the top of the fork. I want to get as much of that fork oil in there as I can. You can measure this. They do make devices to measure, and. The manual actually recommends that that's what you do is you fill it, you cycle the fork tube a number of times, and then you measure it with a special device. I don't have that special device. Maybe I need to buy one. However, I think measuring out the fluid volume accurately should give you a close enough amount. I would imagine this is actually how the factory does it. I doubt they measure the fork height, the fork oil height on every single set of forks. I could be wrong, but I just believe that they probably have a set amount of volume. They fill it up, cycle a fork, and, and that's it. They really aren't a precision fork in any stretch of the imagination. One thing to keep in mind, again, if you do reverse and make your, your uh, ride height a little lower, you're going to also have to adjust the amount of fluid that you put in these forks. It is different and it does list it in the manual.
All right, I think the next thing is the spring. Before I drop that spring in, I'm going to cycle the fork a few times to make sure that the fluid is uh, properly balanced within the fork tubes. It's something you really should do. I'm not sure if this is a factory spring or not. The manual says to install the spring with the tightest wound coils at the top, which leads me to believe that the factory spring probably was um, a progressive spring. This one looks to me to be just a straight rate spring, so I'm going to put it back in the way I found it. You basically just slide it down into the fork like this, gently, and it's going to go down into the oil. I'm going to bring the fork tube up a bit so that oil doesn't overflow. Then our washer goes on and ultimately the spacer you want to inspect your fork cap for stuff like this, a little bit of aluminum from the threads, and make sure that your O-ring is in good shape before you reinstall it. So I'll clean this with a little bit of brake cleaner, it coming out really nice. And now I'm just going to flip it up and thread it down until the O-ring seats. Now you're never going to get this totally tight until it's back in the bike and clamped down with the lower triple clamp bolts, but you just want to seal it up so it doesn't leak on the bench. Before I put this fork gator on, I took it downstairs and cleaned it up really good with a tire brush on the inside and the outside to get off any oil or grit that's trapped inside it. Remember, it was leaking oil and it was coming out through these holes in the bottom. Now that it's nice and clean, we can put this back on. So I'm going to start by putting the lower retaining uh, clamp on. And then I'll just slide the fork gator down and onto the stanchion itself. Let's see if I can do this and not look like an idiot. There we go. With the boot in place, I can now slide the fork tube back up into the triple clamps. I'll put through the bottom, and then I'll use my finger to line it up flush with the top of the upper triple clamp. I'll use my Allen key and torque those two lower bolts to 26 Newton meters and then I'll just use a screwdriver to bring the boot all the way up to the top and secure it so it doesn't slide down. Next, I'm going to use my 22 millimeter to torque the top cap to 23 Newton meters. And finally, I'm going to use that 14 millimeter to torque the top bolt to 29 Newton meters. And you're done. Putting the wheel on can be really, really challenging by yourself. What I found helps me anyway is to actually leave the caliper disconnected, put the wheel on, get the spacer in, all that kind of stuff, and then remount the caliper and torque it up. It allows you to basically focus on one thing at a time, getting the wheel on and then putting the brake on. Now I have done it where I've left the caliper in place, you line the rotor up and try to get it up inside there, and you can do it. If you've got two people, it's not too bad. But when you're doing it by yourself, do yourself a favor and do one thing at a time. What I'll do now is I'll put on the, um, I'll put the axle through, I'll fit the drive mechanism on there, and then I'll slide it through and put the bushing on this side and slide the axle all the way through. So let, let's do that now. As you lift the wheel up, you're going to guide the speedometer drive into its groove at the back of the fork leg. Your axle then slides through the drive mechanism and then supporting the wheel you put the spacer onto the left hand fork tube. Sl continue to slide the axle through and twisting it you'll thread it into that lower fork stanchion. You can see it here. This is really difficult sometimes by yourself so take your time. Once you get it started come back over and now you can thread back in the drive cable for the speedometer mechanism. So I get it started and then holding with a little bit of pressure I spin the front wheel and the drive cable will drop right into the gears. Secure it with your machine screw and then you can come in and finally tighten down the axle bolt to 65 Newton meters. Follow this up by tightening the four nuts in a crisscross pattern to 10 Newton meters and now the wheel is fully clamped and safe. I'm going to take my brake caliper now and I'm going to slide it over the uh, rotor and then I'll feed those uh, small bolts in by hand. Tighten these up to 26 Newton meters and really the only thing left to do now is secure the brake hose 
with that small bolt from earlier against the stanchion tube. Oh, there we go. Okay, that wraps up today's project of changing the fork seals on this Suzuki DR650. It really was not all that hard, and I hope the video gives you some confidence to try this project yourself. You're gonna need a few tools that are specialized to do this, or you can go online, there's a few hacks that will allow you to get around buying the tools. But as I said earlier, buying tools is an investment and it builds your shop over time. Instead of giving the money to a dealership, you can buy the tools and do the job yourself. And you get the satisfaction of knowing the job's really done well and understanding how that system works within the motorcycle or the power sport unit that you have. Okay, I've got a few more things that I have to do. I gotta put some tools away here. So that kind of wraps up today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment down below and let me know what you think, if you thought it was a good video or not. And I've got a question. I'm looking to maybe make a little bit of revenue off this channel, and I'm wondering if maybe I should set up a Patreon account or maybe sell some merchandise. I know everybody does this, but I really do like making the videos, and they do take a bit of time to make. So I want to ask if people would be interested in supporting the channel in that way. Let me know in the comments down below. And until next time, I'm Dino. You have yourself a great day, and I'll see you soon here on Dino's Tinker Shed. Can't wait to get back out and ride now.